Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Welcome everyone. This is Bree Noble at The Profitable Musician and I'm excited today to be with Danielle Tucker. Danielle came on my radar because she was doing this amazing musician summit and I have done summits. I've done two of them and they are like overwhelming. Let me just say like they take up a lot of time. They are amazing, right? They're amazing because you have this interaction with people. You're able to help people. You're able to um, just really interact with people but they are a lot of work. And so I was thinking, you know, musicians, we do a lot of like online live events, especially now during the pandemic. Um, And, you know, things like maybe online festivals where you bring a lot of artists together. Maybe you do like a, a really awesome, like live stream where you're trying to bring in all of your fans, you know, or maybe you just have big projects that you're trying to work on. Maybe you're doing a big release party for your release. And it's a lot to handle, right? And it's it's a little bit daunting. And so I thought it would be cool to bring in Danielle and talk about kind of her process of how she put this thing together and and how she breaks down a project and stuff. And I thought it'd be super helpful for you guys for any events that you're wanting to do in the future. But before we get to that, I just want Danielle to share her background with you, her background in music and you know what made her want to do this summit. Oh, thank you, Bree. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to um, talk to you. As I mentioned before, when we've talked before, I have been a longtime follower of yours. And I was thinking this morning, I think it was probably since 2009, because that's when I uh, put out my first release. I was digging into, you know, how do I do all of this (laughs) at the time? So yeah, well, um, I am a professional singer. That's uh, what I do full time. I work in a corporate show band called the Mighty Untouchables. And um, I also do some vocal coaching on the side. And uh, when COVID hit, um, I all of a sudden had a ton of time on my hands. And um, I also had a soft spot for the community of singers and musicians. um, And just, you know, the the pain and confusion and loss that we were all experiencing. So I started a a weekly interview series um, called the Pandemic Proof Singer Series. And eventually that spun into the Pandemic Proof Singer Summit. Um, It really just kind of coming together as a community, helping to lift one another up and identify ways that we can pave a path forward for um, the year and continue doing what we love and continue making money at it if that's important to you. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And and I think it was, you know, it was the right idea, the right time for sure. And I know a lot of people got a ton of value out of it. What what made you think that you could do this thing, right? Cuz I know when I first did a summit, I I had an idea of how hard it was going to be. And I'm like, I can't do this by myself. And I, so I brought in a partner to help me, especially with all the tech and all the, you know, the setup and everything behind the scenes kind of stuff. Did you have any help putting this together? I did. I had a lot of help, but I'll I'll say that I'm glad I didn't know then what I know now because (laughs) it was a huge undertaking. Um, I thought I wanted to do this because I myself have attended a lot of um, virtual events, summits, conferences, and everything. And I like the format. I get a lot out of it Um, and just when the idea struck me, it just really, it felt right to me because this sort of um, planning and organizing and, uh, you know, networking is just, it's just kind of my bag. It's just something that, you know, um, uh, 
that was a good fit for me. I, I have um, my mind organized as well and thrives, you know, in, in these kinds of projects. So, you know, I knew it was going to be a big undertaking, but I, um, I'm glad of my naivete at the time. <laughs> so what kind of team did you have behind you to, to help you get this together? Well, um, after kind of putting my strategy together and, and, you know, coming up with a mainframe to pull everything together, that was really then when I realized, you know, that I was going to need, um, a pretty significant amount of help. So first and foremost, I had, um, two VAs working with me. Um, and I did my very best to delegate, you know, as many tasks out as I could for that. Um, I had to line up quite a lot of, um, childcare. To handle it i've got two little ones so it was important that i really mapped out you know the time to do this and and had all of their bases covered but um i reached out to a lot of uh subcontractors as far as um getting graphic design work some um website work done um gosh uh, some copy written um all kinds of things so there was you know there was a significant amount of help that went into it so I think this could be really useful for musicians to talk about how you kind of came up with a, a budget and a plan for this, because, you know, maybe they're going to be doing a, a release show mm -hmm. or something like that, or they want to do like a big online festival or something. And I mean, you, you hoped to make income from this, but you didn't know that you were going to make income for sure. Right. So how did you kind of estimate like, this is how much I think I'm going to make. This is how much I can pay these people to help me out and, you know, and, and childcare and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think from the get go, I knew my, I knew what my why was involved in all this. That was really the most important thing. So I knew, um, above all, you know, financial gain or, um, you know, um, audience growth above that. I, I knew what the principal why was in the matter. And so everything kind of, um, trickled from there. So I set, um, a smart goal like you talk about. Okay. Um, so I just had identified, you know, what my financial goal was in everything and what, you know, audience growth was and what other, what other aspects of it I was hoping to achieve and, and what I hoped the audience would get out of it too. And then I just started um, really reverse engineering everything from there. Uh, you know, in event planning, it can go from mild to wild. It can be very simple or it can be very grandiose. And so I really kind of, it took a lot of planning up front to, um, you know, decide, all right, am I going big with this or, you know, so let me just say, I guess it was a balance of, um, I had a certain amount of, um, money to work with in the, from the beginning. Um, I, I made a lot of estimates and then, um, you know, as time went on and, and everything started, uh, rolling out budgets changed. Um, but it really ended up being, um, a numbers game. I, I knew, you know, what my financial goal was and I knew how many people I needed to attract to the summit and, and, you know, what sales would have to unfold out of that. So lots of planning, lots of number crunching. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's really useful to obviously have those numbers. Um, mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions for artists, if they, if they don't have those numbers, like they've never done an event like this, well, you, you hadn't either. So how did you kind of extrapolate? Did you like, I, did you just kind of decide, like, I think that this percentage of people are going to, you know, pay for it or, and I'm just thinking about artists, you know, when they're setting up an event, like maybe a festival, like how many people are they going to be able to like buy it, get to buy a ticket that they attract, or if they're doing a release party, how many people are they going to be able to get to buy their bundle or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess it's really just kind of breaking it down from um, deciding what, um, what kind of profit do I need or want from this? What are all of the expenses that are going to go into that? So I added up all of that. So let's just say 
you know, um, I'll just use a number like $10,000. Let's say $10,000 was my um, end revenue goal. And that would include um, all of the expenses that went into it, plus what I wanted to profit out of it. And then um, I just kind of began breaking down, all right, if I needed that amount of money, here's how many packages I would need to sell in order to do that and um, at various price points. So I played a little bit with that based on um, you know, what I thought was a reasonable price to pay something, um, and, you know, had a couple of different tiers of pricing. So I broke down, all right, how many people would I need to purchase that? And from then, uh, from there on, um, there's definitely some, um, you know, marketing numbers that I think would be a little more substantial with this answer, but you've got to, um, then identify, all right, if I have X amount of people come of that, how many will pay (laughs) at that point? And um, I kind of base things off of a, like a a one to 10% rule. I figured Mm. if, you know, if I had um, a thousand people, 10% of those people would pay, which would then translate to this amount of money. So, um, I guess it's, there's just so many variables at play there. So you've really got to kind of map out the whole formula knowing, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a release party determining, all right, um, how much is it going to cost for me to put this event on? Um, if I'm selling, you know, CDs or downloads, um, what is my price point for all of those? How would I, how many would I need to sell at that point, which then will tell you how many people do you need to, uh, attract or invite to the event. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you're lucky, you have some historical data, you know, if you've done an event and you know that there's a hundred people in the room and you sell, you know, uh, five of your super fan bundle and you sell, you know, 10 CDs and you sell 30 stickers or something, you know, like, you know, percentage wise, you can kind of see that over time. Yes. And if you've been keeping track of your numbers, then you can extrapolate that into your, you know, your future thing. And it doesn't even have to be the same items. It can be like, you know, this, like she said, tears, right. You know, mm-hmm. well, I have these fans that are like up here, they'll buy everything I put out. And then there's this level where they just want to buy something and, th- but they won't buy the most expensive. And then there's, a, they just really want to support me, but they only have a few dollars. They're buying stickers or something, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you can kind of see like percentage wise, what that is of your audience. So I, I think that's a really helpful breakdown that you did for, you know, any kind of event that we're doing, especially when we don't know exactly Mm -hmm. what's going to happen, but we have to at least come up with some kind of data to start with. Right, right. Yeah. And I think if you, another factor too, is if you identify these huge gaps and possibility where if you, you know, if you're trying to throw a $20,000 event and you have a, you know, $10 $10 CD that you're selling, that's, that's going to be an enormous amount of quantity that you'd have to put out. So there's other things that you could consider like bringing in sponsors, um, you know, that could, you know, make up for, um, you know, some of those gaps and what you think. Perfect segue. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you about next. Did you, consider bringing in sponsors. Now I encourage artists in my rock your next release program. We talk about actual physical, uh, release parties when they're available. And there are so many ways to bring in sponsors to those, right? I I know artists that have gotten like all their food and, and drink and decorations and flowers and chairs and all that stuff sponsored by local companies. But online is a little bit different. Um, it can be better and it can be not as better. I mean, local is great because people want to support local people. And, yeah. and I, I find that, that companies are really great in supporting local artists and wanting to, you know, just be out in the community as a company. Uh, online, of course, it opens up like a much bigger array of people that you can talk to, but you know, the deliverables are different for sponsors. And in our second, well, we had sponsors both years in our summit, but the second year we really dug into that and had some really great sponsors um, at, you know, higher levels that really helped us basically paid for all of our advertising, which was fantastic. Did you have sponsors? 
I summit? did not, but it was a big consideration. It's actually something, it, it was a plan. I had a strategy in place um, if I was going to go into that, but just based on the timeline that I was working under, I got to a point where I realized, I don't think I need to go down this avenue. And I knew what um, kind of a time investment I'd have to make and, uh, you know, approaching everybody and, you know, um, kind of fulfilling all of the, um, you know, things that you do to accommodate a sponsor and everything. So ultimately I, I decided not to, I would have loved to though. And sh should I do, you know, this type of event again, that would be, um, a major thing that I would definitely plan for. Yeah. And I get why, I mean, like I said, our first year, we half-heartedly tried. <laughs> yeah. I had someone reaching out for me, but it just, it wasn't organized. It was not early enough. We started to find that you know, companies had already spent all of their budget for the year in advance. They'd already like earmarked all of their budget. So I found it was a much longer game mm -hmm. than I realized the first yeah. time. So the second time I started talking to people like a year in advance, I started like just yeah. putting out those breadcrumbs about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely say for artists, if you've got sponsors that you want to work with for anything in the future, I would start putting those breadcrumbs out there and be yes. like, Hey, we're thinking of doing this big festival with, uh, you know, all of these Americana artists, um, you know, next year, <laughs> would you guys be interested in being a sponsor, you know, or at least putting this up to your budget committee or whatever, you know, because there are bigger companies, they have budgets for this stuff. Mm -hmm. but they have to go and say like, you know, okay, we're going to earmark this amount for this and this amount for this. So you really have to start thinking way in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And fortunately too, for you, that having been a second or third time around too, you had data to back yeah, up what you were helped. asking for. That's so important when you're going to ask for support like that, that you be ready and prepared to let them know um, what they'll be getting out of this. So as you know, as an indie artist, um, you may want to be able to tell them what what size your audience is and, you know, um, historically what kind of a response you get to your uh, releases, just, just so they know why they would be jumping into this in the first place. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And if you're doing something with other artists, like I mentioned a, a festival, mm -hmm. you know, online or offline, a, you know, some kind of collaboration with a few artists that you're kind of holding a themed event or something, um, you can get the data from all those other artists as yeah. well and be like, oh, well, they have a list of a thousand, they have a list of 2000, they have a list of 500, and then this is their social media numbers. And, you know, you can make it look pretty good if you do that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So did you, um, do advertising for this outside of, you know, the speakers that were involved promoting it to, to their lists and stuff? Yeah, I did. Um, I did run some Facebook ads and I used the help of a Facebook ads manager to do that for me. And um, I had a lot of good uh, success with that. Um, Facebook ads are something I have done them in the past on my own um, with not good results. So I was very leery of <laughs> investing any money into that. So I really thought that through and decided, okay, I'm going to take this to somebody who knows what they're doing. So, <laughs> so I had the, you know, amount of money that I wanted to invest into the ads, um, and the amount of money that I would have to pay the manager. And between the two of us, we really crunched those numbers again too. So we knew what kinds of numbers we needed to hit, mm -hmm. um, in order to make all of that worthwhile to begin with. So, um, yeah, if you haven't done Facebook ads, um, it's, it's a big le learning curve and you, you can potentially, um, blow a lot of money, but, uh, if, you know, if you have somebody who knows what they're doing, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I agree. Like, don't just jump in there and think yeah. that you can do it by yourself at first. There's, mm -hmm. you will, you will spend enough, you know, for like a full education in Facebook ads, just on losing money on the advertising yes. that you start doing at first. Cause there's, there's so many facets to it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Well, so I would love to know, like, are there, is there any other advice that you can give artists about if they're planning a big project like this, how do they break it down? You know, what kind of, um, you know, uh, like software or like 
ways to keep track of tasks? Like how did you communicate with your team? All that stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have always followed kind of the same formula my entire life on how I break down big projects. As I said, this is just something I love getting involved with. I've done CD releases, um, this, you know, this huge virtual event, live streams and everything. Um, so the way I always tackle it is identifying the who, what, when, where, why, how, all of those. And I, but I really do reverse engineer that. I, I'm always beginning with the um, why, why am I doing this to begin with? Um, what do I personally expect to get out of it? What do I professionally, financially expect to get out of it? What do the people being involved, um, what should they expect to get out of it? What do my attendees um, get out of it? I need to know what that is going into anything because that's going to be the thing that helps me set all my goals in the first place, but also it's going to be the thing that fuels me through the difficult parts of the planning. And when it gets to be you know, a hassle and it will, you know, when you know really why you're gunning for it and it really helps to, um, it helps you decide on every other variable of what you're doing. Um, and then I'll usually determine the where, what kind of a platform am I going to be using? What kind of a venue am I going to be using? Um, where's all of this happening? Is it, you know, happening from my office? Um, that's a great, um, jumping off point. Um, so I had determined, you know, that I was going to run the event from my website. Um, everything was pre-recorded. And so I knew that that was my major platform, but there's so many others like Zoom, StreamYard, OBS. There's a million different, um, you know, online stream streaming platforms that you can use nowadays. But um, you've just got to look into it and figure out what would be best for you, what would make the most sense and work for your audience and your budget. Um, and then really determining the when, um, a lot of consideration goes into um, – you know, are we going to be conflicting with any kind of a holiday? Are we going to be um, conflicting with um, other similar events? So if you have other artists that are in your genre that might also be hosting a, an, a similar event, you know, within close proximity, you might want to consider spacing that out a little bit. Um, you know, you don't want to plan something like this on Super Bowl Sunday, you know, where, where your audience is going to be you know, um, distracted. Um, my when was, was interesting because I did it mid November and it was right after the election <laughs> and right before the holidays. And so I had a super tight timeline to work with. Um, but I, I had a strategy behind that. It, fortunately it worked out, but, but, um, it could have potentially been. Very did nice. your ads manager mention that ad ads costs would might be quite high around the election. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so because of that, um, my advertising began two days after the election. Ugh. So I wanted things to like chill a little bit. <laughs> and so I figured everybody's going to need a breath of fresh air here and, you know, yeah. see something else popping yes. up on the screen. <laughs> yeah. So that was definitely something that um, I thought through and, and the when also should really tell you, you know, what kind of a timeline do you need to work with? You know, if you've got a big undertaking, um, there's lots of things to consider. And, you know, um, looking back, just the more time you can give yourself in advance, the better. Uh, like you said, you started talking to um, sponsors a year in advance. And that may seem like a long time. But, you know, when you consider how busy people's schedules are and agendas, yep. you know, you've got to get ahead of those things. So give yourself as much time as possible. Um, and then I usually will dive into the what, you know, what is this event going to look like? What's it going to feel like? Um, what are the you know, objectives, um, what kind of content are we going to be creating? Um, what's the feel of it? Is it a party? Is it a celebration? Is it more of a, you know, educational experience? Is it something to relax everyone or inspire everyone? Um, I just, I like to know what that, you know, greater vision is. Um, and then, 
you know, knowing the who, you know, who is the audience, um, who's perfect for this so that you're not, um, getting too general. Um, and then that'll also dictate who else is involved with it. You know, if you're going to have a supporting act, um, or if you're going to have, um, you know, other musicians involved with this, do you have similar audiences that could help, you know, support, um, bringing in more numbers? Um, and then, it, then it gets down to the nitty gritty of the how. Um, I am a huge believer in strategy and um, scheduling everything, creating a timeline and no, no detail uh, should, should be missed, I mean, or taken for granted, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I will literally calendar and schedule every single move I'm going to make and the moves of, you know, everyone else that I have involved, you know, whether it's a VA or just someone in general. Yeah, no detail is too small to put on, you know, your Asana task list or whatever you're using to keep track of that, because otherwise it will fall through the cracks. Yeah, yeah. And there, yeah, speaking of Asana, there were so many great resources that I used. Um, if you're planning a big event, there's really a lot of um, uh, frameworks and coursework that you can find online nowadays that will help you uh, kind of execute a bigger event like this. Um, but if it's something a, a little bit more small scale that you can use on your own, there's so many great resources like Asana. Asana is a, you know, task management um, thing online, but there's, there's a ton of them too. Airtable, um, gosh, Basecamp. Trello, yeah. uh, Monday.com. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, even just, you know, using a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet to track everything too. But um, yeah, you just, you've got to have those things in place for sure. Now, how much time did you give yourself and like, was there a period, I know for me, like I said, I was starting with sponsors like way out, but it was like every week I had on my Asana checklist, you know, speak to three new potential sponsors or something like that, or follow up with these people. But then I wasn't doing anything with the summit until about three months out is when I really started getting like, okay, now I need to contact all the speakers. I need to set up our appointments, all that. How much time did you give yourself for all this stuff? Yeah. I had a 90 day timeline. Yeah. That sounds and, about right. Uh, yeah. Looking back, um, I, if I were to do it again, I would have given myself, I think at least 120 days to mm. do it. Um, if not more, if not more time, just because, you know, 90 days is a pretty quick turnaround considering, you know, all of the schedules that you need to organize with other, you know, attendees and participants and everything. And, um, it felt like, it felt like a big crunch. Not so to mention I, things going wrong. When I was yes. doing my summit interviews, we had a ginormous snowstorm and it shut down our power for days. Mm -hmm. And like, I had to cancel five or six interviews and reschedule. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only reason I really chose that 90 day, um, turnaround was because I had really pinpointed mid November as the time that I really wanted to do it. And by that time we were about 90 days out. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. More time. Yeah, but on the other hand, like if you give yourself too long, you know, you can always, you it'll always fill up the space, right? You can yes. always just keep doing more. So it's got to be that balance of like, not too long, but not, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something that's just going to stress you out either. Right, right. And I and, and being realistic too about the time commitment that these these things take. Um, it should be I would consider something like this, um, a little season of your life where you really need to clear the space to do something like this. So if you're planning a, you know, big release party or, um, you know, a release in general, um, clear away as much obligation as possible so that this can be the center point of what you're doing and that it can t get your time and energy because the time, the energy, the brain juice that it takes to <laughs> pull all of this off, it can be exhausting. And if you've got a million other things going on at the same time, um, it's tough, you know, so if you can uh, clear away as much space as possible for it. I highly recommend that also. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's just like you said, releasing an album um, or an EP, you know, I recommend releasing 
a single a month for the three months before it to just like have this lead up and this and this ramp of excitement. And you really have to be on, you know, you, you have to be yeah. focused on that for those three months, like hit this single as hard as you can now hit this single as hard as you can. You know, you're not going to do this forever. This is going to be a short window of time that you're really, really focused on this, but it's going to be worth it. Cause otherwise, you know, you put all this time and money and effort into this thing and it's not going to be as effective as you want because you didn't give yourself like give yourself the absolute total focus that you needed to to put into it. Yeah, definitely. Fully agree with that. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. This has been really helpful to just kind of break down how you put together an event like this. And it got me thinking about my summits and, um, why I didn't do one in this last year, because it's, it is very overwhelming. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's why I tell people, some people ask me, you know, shouldn't I just release a single every month for a year and then release my album? And I'm like, I get why some people say that in the Spotify world and algorithms and things, but in my opinion, you cannot give yourself fully to promote a single every month by the time you get to the album, you'll be so burnt out. You won't even care. Oh, you know, yeah. you'll just drop the album and you'll be done. 100%. And, and so why not put your full effort into something that, like you said, is a, is a season, but it's not like taking over your entire life. You just know that like, this is, I used to say, oh, it's summit season, you know, yes. and this is what <laughs> I'm doing from uh, February through April. And, yeah. and I'm fine with that because I, I know exactly what I'm going to get out of it. Like you said, I know my why, and I know that it's okay that I'm not paying attention to other things because this is my focus right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's a, the virtual event planning too, is it's such a blessing now and so worth learning the nuts and bolts of, because while of course we all anticipate and are excited for when we can do um, these events in person and kind of execute everything in person. That's great. But now we also have this additional resource where you can potentially do both at once, you know, have your live person event, but also make it virtually available. So you're not only able to accommodate people who are, you know, within um, your location or can get to your location, but you're broadening your reach so much by having the ability to do it online as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's, these things are going to um, follow us into the future, no matter what. Oh, absolutely. I definitely recommend a physical release and an online release, no matter what, whether we're where we are now in the world or not, you yeah. should always do both if you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I did want to mention too, the non-tangible things that came out of this event and that can come out of events, especially when you're collaborating with other artists, maybe a festival or, or something like that. Um, I know that like, I'd never met you before, right? That's a relationship that came out of this. Yes. Um, I got introduced by you to some other people that I didn't know. So I have always found that that summits and events in general are relationship builders that can, you know, build up these assets of relationship that go with you into the future. Would you agree that that did that for you? Was that one of your goals or did it, was it just like a, a very happy byproduct? I wholeheartedly agree with that. In fact, you know, while the financial aspect of it um, was great, um, the uh, those intangibles were far outweigh anything that I financially gained from this. Just those relationships that I built, built and how they they roll from one thing to another to another. Um, the lives that were affected uh, with you know just attending the event itself, um, and just. <laughs> the joy that it brought into my life personally pulling everything together. I mean, you know, as a full-time performer, um, you know, I'm really have that void in my life. And so, um, this was just so, um, meaningful, made me so happy. It made other people happy. It expanded, you know, my network of friends and colleagues. Um, and so, and there's, you know, lots of other opportunities that I'm sure are still gonna, uh, come out of it. So yeah, so much to gain from it. Awesome. I'm so glad you said that. Cause that has been my biggest thing with summits yeah. is yes, I, I, I enjoyed it. I love the interviews. I love the content. 
Um, I'm so glad that I'm able to share that with artists, but for me, I gained so many new, new friends, people that I now mastermind with people that I consider friends. I see at conferences and, you know, when that comes back, I can give them a big hug, you know, and, yeah. and it's just so great to develop those relationships. And I, I really encourage artists that work with me to do the same thing, you know, collaborate, do a show with three of you. Uh, I used to be in a group actually, um, that was like three artists that came together and we put on a show together mm -hmm. and we had a name, you know, when we were performing together, but we were also individual artists and it was just such a cool experience. Um, it, it promotes all of you as artists, as well as that, you know, new thing that you create coming together as artists. Mm -hmm. And it just gives you another, another venue to get your, your talent out there and, and be able to connect with fans. So I highly recommend you guys do some collaborative events um, yes. after hearing how Danielle did this. So thank you so much for all of your your explanation of how you did this and um, just encouraging artists that they can do it as well. Do you have any last words of wisdom for people that want to put together either a physical or virtual event? Yeah, you know, I think I would just say if if um, if you have an idea that has sparked around doing something like this, but you're a little fearful of the unknowns, um, I know it can kind of seem a bit daunting and overwhelming, but if you do just kind of break it down as far as you possibly can into um, the smallest of details and ask for help. That's the big thing. Ask for help. Uh, our resources are absolutely unlimited. You can find anybody and anything that you need or any answer you need online nowadays and just also reach out to the people that are around you too. Yeah. And if you want to reach out to Danielle and ask her more questions about how she did it, um, how can how can they reach out to you online? Well, you can find me at daniellettucker.com. Everything that I do is there. You'll find all of my social links there. Um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and I have a uh, summit group, which is the Pandemic Proof Singer um, on Facebook. Uh, anyone is welcome to join that group as well. But probably the best thing to do would be to go to daniellettucker.com, join my email list and I'm always um, sending out updates and you can also um, reach me personally there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Danielle. I really appreciate you sharing all of this with us. Oh, thank you, Bree. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.